Okay, we're picking it up uh, tonight on session 45, lesson 8, page 18. And let's just do a little bit, uh, a little bit of review to uh, get us uh, up to speed regarding uh, the new material. Well, remember I've shared with you already that the key idea of this section is repetition. Sections 139 to 152 is a repetition of much of the instruction Jesus uh, issued in Galilee, but now we're to the south. Now we're in Judea and in Jerusalem, and so he's repeating his, um, his instruction again again so that the Judeans uh, personally get his uh, teaching as well. As he uh, taught, he was challenged by a lawyer uh, and asked the question, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus launched into the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we learned from uh, that parable that our neighbor is anyone whom we can help, anyone who needs our aid. Here a Samaritan, an outcast, a, a heretic, helped uh, the Jewish man who had been uh, beaten by the robbers. He turned out to be the neighbor and so Jesus said to the uh, lawyer, you go and do likewise. By the way, that was an imperative. It was a present imperative. He was telling him, he was commanding him, uh, show compassion consistently and um, habitually throughout your life. Do likewise. Do like the Samaritan did, like the outcast did. So after the uh, challenge at the, uh, regarding the uh, neighbor and the good Samaritan, Jesus started out on his preaching tour. And one of the places he went to was Bethany, where he met Mary and Martha and Lazarus. <laughs> and um, I'll, have to, I'll have to use David at the, at the break for the, <laughs> instead, of, instead of the shofar, right? <laughs> David and Jean. <laughs> That'll bring you guys back. <laughs> All right. And here was that 18th century picture of Bethany. Probably uh, very similar to the way Bethany looked when Jesus visited the, uh, the little city. And there, uh, you know, 13 guys descended upon the home of Mary and Martha. And uh, Mary chose to listen to Yeshua's teaching, sitting at his feet. But there's Martha off on the left. She is uh, stressed out trying to take care of these 13 guys, you know, do everything perfectly. So she asked Jesus to chew out Mary and tell her to get to work. No pun intended, by the way. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Roger's offended. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, he tells her that no, Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken away from her. Uh, the disciples also asked for a refresher course on prayer and so we saw the material delivered uh, uh, during the Sermon on the Mount called the Lord's Prayer. Most of that material repeated again as well as Jesus taught them again how to pray. So that brings us to section 144. We're on this teaching tour throughout Judea. And we come in section 144, Luke 11, to the third blasphemous accusation and a second debate. So section 144 is on page 139 of your uh, harmony. And uh, again, page 18 of, uh, of lesson 8. All right, now... Let's note some background here before we get into the verses. The material that we're going to read here is very, very similar to Matthew 12. Remember, Matthew 12 was the casting out of the deaf and dumb demon, a messianic miracle. But there are two main differences. Number one, in Matthew 12, it took place in Galilee, in Capernaum. Here, we're in Judea. And again, I want to emphasize that the entire nation is being exposed to his person and his messianic claims and his messianic miracles. It isn't limited to Galilee. So number one, we have a different location. Number two, in Matthew 12, it was the leaders who responded to the casting out of the deaf and dumb demon by saying that Jesus is not the Messiah, but he performs messianic miracles because he's possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The leaders said that. In this paragraph, Yeshua once again performs that same messianic miracle, but now the multitudes respond. Not the leaders, the multitudes, okay? 
makes it a very different incident. That makes sense? Okay. So let's take a look at the charge. We're in the top of page 18. We start in verses 14 through 16, page 139 in your harmony. Hey, everybody get there all right? All right, verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was dumb. And it came about that when the demon had gone out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled. And some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. So notice now that this time it's the multitudes that's challenging him. They are slowly accepting the Pharisaic position. Step by step, month by month, we're going to see the multitudes now going over to the Pharisee's position, that he's demon-possessed. And um, again, there's this demand for another sign. The signs just don't satisfy anybody, do they? No. Jesus performs a sign, we want another one. He performs a messianic miracle, we want another one. Okay, signs and wonders don't convince anybody. If they're not open to truth and faith, signs and wonders aren't going to convince anybody. So again, many of the details that were given when we covered Matthew 12 are covered. We won't go them into them in as much detail this time. Uh, you can go back to where uh, Matthew 12 was covered in your notes and you can get it in detail there. So Jesus then launches out in verses 17 through 23 with a defense. And he defends his position on uh, four points, in four points, and they're the same four points that we saw in Matthew chapter 12. Verses 17 and 18. But he knew their thoughts. Uh, there's another messianic claim, right? He knows what's going on between their ears. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a house divided against itself falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. So his first point, your accusation of demon possession cannot be true because that would mean a division in Satan's kingdom. That would mean civil war in Satan's kingdom and its destruction and Satan doesn't allow that and his kingdom is not uh, disintegrating because of civil war. So your, your accusation, your uh, assessment of who I am cannot be correct on that basis. Verse 19. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be your judges. Second point, basically, is your evaluation is inconsistent because the gift of exorcism was recognized as a gift of the Spirit and it was a uh, it was utilized by your own disciples. It's not a gift from Satan. And the, the very people who accused him of, uh, of a demon exorcism being uh, from Beelzebul also exorcised demons themselves. So they are being inconsistent. They would have to either say Jesus is exercising a gift from God or we are exercising a gift from Satan in order to be consistent. But they won't do that. They won't say their exorcisms are from Satan. Verse 20. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And remember that uh, the terminology, the finger of God, means the direct intervention of God. So basically he's saying, your accusation is untrue because this miracle authenticates the Messiahship of Jesus. It is done by the direct intervention of God, by the finger of God. Okay, so you're, you, you just, you're way off base here. God is the one involved here, not Satan or demons. Verses 21 through 23. Sure. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I am, I, am, uh, I am inviting you to enter the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm here. I'm the Messiah King. All right, verses 21 to 23. 
When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. And he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. The final point he makes is that your accusation cannot be correct because the Messiah is stronger than Satan. I am stronger than Satan. I am overpowering Satan. It's not the other way around. And then he issues this little warning. You're either with me or you're against me. Take your pick. Uh, after finishing up his defense on these four points, he now teaches about the condition of the nation. In point uh, four there, we're toward the bottom of page 18. And the condition, the explanation of the condition of the nation starts in verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes out and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So he repeats the story that he told in Matthew chapter 12 about this man who's demon-possessed. The demon leaves. Uh, nothing replaces the demon, and the demon returns. And the point is the state of that man is now worse than it was at the first. And the application is to the nation. The state of the nation will be worse at the end than it was at the first. At the first, the nation was dominated by Rome. That generation of Jewish people was under Roman domination. But in the last state, the nation will be destroyed by Rome. The temple will be gone, Jerusalem will be leveled, and the last state of the nation will be worse than the first. That's his point there. That's his warning. Question. How much time is there between Matthew 12 and... And here? I think it's about a year. About a year. All right, Matthew, uh, verses 27 and 28. And it came about, while he said these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So again, just like in Matthew chapter 12, he repudiates earthly ties in favor of spiritual ties. Now, originally, back in Matthew 12, the repudiation came when his family tried to get him. Remember, he's crazy. He's gone Meshuggah. We need to get him. And um, so he repudiated his earthly ties in, relation, in favor of spiritual ties. Now, this is a different situation because it's down in Judea, but the point is still the same. Those who are blessed are those who learn the word of God and do it. Uh, you aren't blessed just because you're born into a certain family. And did you notice in verse 27, that's a very biblical and very Jewish statement. The idea of being born again, being in a certain family, being a child of the king, being a daughter of the king, that kind of a thing. Uh, here's another typical kind of a statement from the Tosefta Hagigah 2.1. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said, Happy are you, our father Abraham that Eliezer ben Arach came forth from your loins. Well, did um, Abraham really uh, physically generate Eliezer ben Arach? No, Abraham had died 2,000 years earlier. So he's not talking physically here. He's talking spiritually, that um, uh, Eliezer ben, ben Arach was a godly man. And so he was imitating his father Abraham. And see, this, this idea of birth Rebirth, being born again, all those kind of pictures are very, part, very much part and parcel of the Jewish community in the first century and of the Bible. Just a typical kind of uh, uh, picture that this woman uh, speaks about as well. All right, point five. We come to the uh, sign for that generation. Uh, verses 29 through 32. 
And as we go through these verses, I want you to notice the emphasis on that generation. Okay? Verse 29. And as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Verse 32, top of page 140. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So again, the sign for that generation is going to be the sign of Jonah, the sign of resurrection. And then again comes the warning of condemnation for that generation at the great white throne judgment. You see, Gentiles are going to be able to condemn this particular Jewish generation because they committed the unpardonable sin. The Queen of Sheba. She didn't have a lot of light. She lived during a uh, Solomon's era. She didn't have a lot of light, but she was willing to come from the southern tip of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and find out the truth. The men of Nineveh, Gentiles, they didn't have a lot of light, but they responded to the light brought by Jonah, and they repented. But this generation has had a blazing searchlight shined on them with the coming of the Messiah. Are they repenting? Are they seeking the truth? No. That's the warning. So he calls to the nation. He calls to the nation in verses 33 through 36. This is not anger and bitterness and resentment. This is a grief. This is a call to his Jewish brothers and sisters to repent and change their mind. Verse 33. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, nor under a peck measure, but on the lampstand in order that those who enter may see the light. And see, Jesus is the lampstand there, right? He's the light bl blazing brightly in the room there. The lamp of your body is your eye. When your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you may not be darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it shall be wholly illuminated as when a lamp illuminates you with its rays. So his invitation, his plea here is to accept him, is to walk in the light. Walk in the light. To reject me is to walk in darkness. It's as though you, uh, you get um, a film over your eye and no light can penetrate. And so your body is in darkness, you know. Uh, accept the light so that your whole being may be illuminated by God's light. So again, section 144 is very much a repetition of what happened up in Capernaum in Galilee. All right, section 145, page 19. We come to the woes against the scribes and the Pharisees while eating with a Pharisee. So uh, the setting here is an offense. Jesus offends this Pharisee. And so there's a response. So we begin in verses 37 and 38. Now, when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. And when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially, ceremonially washed before the meal. All right, so once again, Jesus is invited by a Pharisee out to lunch, and once again, the invitation is not for the purpose of hospitality. This Pharisee is looking for further charges against him. And again, as in section 111, this happened back in section 111, again, Jesus does not wash his hands. And when this Pharisee sees this, he's offended. He marvels at it that Jesus didn't wash before lunch. Well, why? We remember 
the rabbinic theology on hand washing. The Talmud, so top 4b. A person who despises the washing of hands before a meal is to be excommunicated. <coughs> this messianic pretender should be uh, kicked out of the community. He didn't wash his hands. Whoever eats bread without first washing his hands is as though he had sinned with a harlot. Uh, this is a messianic claimant. What kind of man is this? Notice how he's getting upset and marveling and being, a, a, uh, being offended. Rabbi the Talmud, Ma'asei Shabbat, uh, Shabbat 62b. Rabbi Abahu said, Others say, in a Baraita, a Baraita is additional rabbinic writing, in a Baraita it was taught, three things bring a man to poverty. One of those is treating the washing of hands with disrespect. Okay, so you're going to be, you're going to be spiritually condemned and you're going to suffer uh, uh, materially, if you don't wash your hands. Question. How they get going on that? This is washing hands, I mean. uh, the uh, cleanliness idea. It, it comes off of being clean and unclean, ceremony clean and unclean in the law. But this is tradition. There's nothing in the law that says you have to wash your hands. Well, the rabbis love to take everything to its extremes. Okay? They love to do that. And we've had thousands of years to perfect the technique. <laughs> All right. Now, um, washing of hands is still very much part of the Orthodox Jewish community, and it's still taken very, very seriously. And you can see that from this silver hand washing cup that you can purchase online if you'd like to <coughs> pick one up. And you see how intricate it is? It's a nice piece of work, isn't it? It's to beautify the uh, tradition. Now notice it's got two handles. Two handles. Why would it have two handles? Well, that's because of the way you implement the tradition. You have dirty hands. You're unclean, right? So you grab one handle with an unclean hand. You put the water in it and you pour it all over this hand. This hand is now clean. Ah. Now you can grab the cup with a clean hand. And you get water in it and you can wash this hand. Now you've got clean hands. You do that three times, by the way. You do that three times, and that's the ceremony. No, no, it's not, not under rabbinic Judaism. It's this cup thing. No, no soap. No, you didn't have any soap back in those days. Just, just clear cold water. Not in rabbinic theology. Okay, it, it, uh, uh, believe me. Ask the question. There's, there's uh, some way to get around that problem. Yeah, no dishwashers, that's for sure. Okay, so you, these cups are very, very in, ornate. You can get beautiful ones. Here's another gorgeous one made out of ceramic. But if you go to Israel, you'll probably see this, but you'll probably see it in a little more humbler way. You go into your uh, hotel bathroom, or if you're in a kibbutz and you go into your bathroom, you will probably see one of these, okay? Uh, a plastic hand-washing cup, you know, with the two handles. And um, I'm sure you guys, when you walked into your bathroom, you looked at that cup and you thought, what in the world is this thing? What is this, a, a two-handed chug-a-lug or something? You know? <laughs> no, no, it's the, they're provided by the uh, hotel or by the uh, kibbutz for Orthodox visitors who want to wash their hands before they go down to dinner, something like that. Um, Question. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the the cleanliness rules in Scripture did help out, you know, pre preventing the spread of germs. But the idea here is not germs. The idea here is ceremonial cleanliness. Okay. Yes, it has that side benefit. All right. So there's washing of hands. That's why the Pharisee is offended and marvelled and upset with this messianic pretender. So at this point, Jesus responds. He launches out with his criticism of what's going on in the Pharisee's mind. Verses 39 through 41. Verse 30 now, 39. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. So what's the Pharisee's problem? 
The Pharisees are condemned for their extreme concern about the externals of the law. You know, the uh, cleanliness rules in the law. While they deny the internals of the law. They were very, very careful to take care of the outside. But on the inside they were full of sin. And you notice from what I've shown you how careful the rabbis are. You know, and external actions do not deal with the internal sin issue. You can take those two-handed cups and you can wash your hands a thousand times a day. And it's not going to wash away your sin, is it? It doesn't deal with the internal. You see, they weren't giving that which was within. See, God wants the inner man first. You know, they weren't willing to clean up the inner man, only the outer man. He says, clean the inner man first in verse 41. Then the outer man is clean. Okay, does that make sense? Deal with the inner man. Because those external actions cannot deal with the internal demands of the law. Now this becomes then a um, basis for three woes against the Pharisees in verses 42 through 44. We're on the woes against the Pharisees. That's in the middle of page 19. Let's pick it up in verse 42. But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe, a tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So again, he condemns the Pharisees for being concerned for the lesser while ignoring the greater. And the uh, Pharisees demanded that everything be tithed. If they got a sunflower seed they, and they weren't sure that it was tithed, they'd cut off a tenth of it and uh, make sure that got to the temple somehow. They would not partake of anything that had not been tithed. And an example of that in the Mishnah is in the, the uh, chapter on tithing, uh, Maase Maaserot, chapter 1. Mishnah 1. They have laid down a general rule concerning tithes. Whatever is considered food and is guarded and grows of the soil is liable to tithes. And then they start listing them. Figs, and I've edited it. Believe me, I've edited it. Grapes, wild grapes, red berries, mulberries, all red fruits, pomegranates, dates, peaches, walnuts, etc., etc. It's a long chapter. They cover it all. They cover it all. Okay? They would not eat anything if they weren't sure that it had not been tithed, had been tithed, okay? All right, so uh, placing their emphasis on the externals, not the internals of the law. Verse 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the front seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. So now they're condemned for an attitude of self-glory. They love to be noticed and to be praised. Verse 44. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. Now, verse 44 is really a condemnation of hypocrisy, because they look good outwardly, but they conceal inner corruption, just like a grave. You know, you can, uh, you can whitewash a grave, and it looks great. It's got this wonderful headstone or carving on it, but what's inside that grave? Corruption, rotting flesh. That's his picture there. So they're condemned for hypocrisy. Now, these three woes were pronounced upon the Pharisees in general for their traditions, for their laws. But among the Pharisees, we have a very specific group of Pharisees called the lawyers. And they're the ones for, responsible for creating and passing these laws. So let's go to verse 45. And one of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. So there's a lawyer there, and he responds, Well, if you condemn the Pharisees in general for these laws, you're condemning the lawyers because we thought them up and we passed them. What does Jesus say? Okay, woe on you lawyers as well. <laughs> and so he then launches into three woes against the lawyers, and we'll take a look at those three woes after our break, okay? All righty, we're going to pick it up on verse 46. And remember the lawyer said, uh, you offended us too. 
when you uh, criticize the Pharisees. So Jesus says, okay, woe to your lawyers as well. And starting in verse 46, he starts in woe number one, verse 46. But he said, woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So number one, vote no number one is basically a woe for making the traditions of the Mishnah mandatory. Now if the requirements of the Mishnah were voluntary, they wouldn't be a burden. You know, you decide whether you want to do them or not, it's up to you. But they made them mandatory. And when, they be, when they're mandatory, they can become very burdensome to people. And you guys, you know, uh, we're pointing our fingers at the Pharisees and their traditions as being a burden. But remember, when you point your yeah. finger at somebody, what do you got? You got three fingers pointing back at you. Church, just a church tradition can be the same way. All right? Traditionalism has not escaped the church. All right, uh, verses 47 through 51. Woe number two. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. Consequently, you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some of them they will persecute, in order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation." From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it will be charged against this generation. Wow. So no, woe number two is a woe for rejecting the prophets, which in turn leads to the rejection of the Messiah, which in turn leads to the destruction of A.D. 70 in verse 51. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70. Woe number three in verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge, you do not enter in yourselves, and those who are entering in you hindered. And so woe, woe number three is for hiding the truth by means of tradition. The tradition covered up the truth, and people couldn't find it. Of course, the Pharisees are a little bit upset by all this, so they respond in verses 53 and 54. And when he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. So notice, very carefully, very aggressively, the Pharisees are examining him to try to find one fault, to try to find one sin, to try to find one misstatement. And remember, previously he opened himself up to them and said, which one of you can accuse me of sin? Well, they're doing everything they can to find an opening to that statement. All right, let's turn to page 20 in your outline. Question. Um, in, um, from verse 44, what does it mean, no, um, 47, what does it mean you build the tombs of the prophets? He's just... Um, you build the tombs of the prophets, the fathers uh, rejected the prophets and uh, killed some of them. Okay, so they built the tombs of the prophets. They uh, caused the prophets' death. Uh, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. For you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers that killed them. The fathers killed the, the prophets, but they, uh, they align themselves with their fathers by decorating the tombs instead of rejecting that whole idea they're decorating the tombs. And so they're, what he's doing is he's associating them with the forefathers that rejected the prophets. Okay, sorry, I got that backwards to begin with. All right, lesson eight, page 20 at the top, section 146. Now he turns to the disciples and he warns them about this problem of hypo hypocrisy. And Luke again is covering this. Remember, Luke is covering his activities in Judea during this preaching tour. And John will cover his activities in Jerusalem. Verse 1. And again, note the consistent methodology here. 
Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of the multitude had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So regardless of the masses, the ones he teaches are the disciples. To the masses, he'll teach in parables to hide the truth, but to the disciples, he will explain the truth clearly. The lesson is going to be for them. And uh, notice, there were thousands of people there. He attracted huge crowds. They were stepping on one another, you know, just packed in shoulder to shoulder. Even so, he doesn't go with the, uh, with the crowds. He focuses on the disciples. So the lesson is based on the previous one, the previous paragraph, where the Pharisees are characterized by hypocrisy. So that's why he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So six lessons for these disciples to pick up. First of all, verses 2 and 3. But there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in inner rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. His first point, practice total honesty and transparency so there's never a need to hide anything because the truth always comes out. That's kind of scary. I don't like that at all. <laughs> but the truth always comes out and the, the Lord knows what goes on between our ears anyway. So you might as well be honest and truthful with people and with the Lord. Verses 4 and 5. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I warn you, I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So God is the proper object of fear, not men. You know, men really have very little power. All they can do is kill us. That's all they can do. But from God's perspective, there's something a lot worse that happens after we leave this world. And that's what happens to us when we fall into God's hands. And that's eternal judgment or eternal life. That's what we should really be worried about. That's the true power. Not in men. Not in men. I know, we get terrified of men, but God says, no, no, you really shouldn't be. Take my perspective on life. Verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? And yet, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. So in verses 6 and 7, his basic point is that God is the proper object of trust. Now, it's sometimes hard for us to trust others because of maybe what our family life was like or maybe because of the... Uh, We've been betrayed at work or in our marriage or something. Sometimes it's very, very hard for us to trust. But God is our proper object of trust, he says, for two reasons. One is omniscience. He knows everything. He knows every little sparrow that falls to the ground. He knows every hair in our head. He knows everything. He knows all the dark, deep, little, horrible places tucked away in the closets of our lives. He knows about all those dark places. And yet, he still loves us. Okay? His, his knowledge is omniscient, and his love is exhaustive. We can trust him, no matter what happens. I see a question. That's what he wants to do from our lives. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Perfect love casts out fear in the New Testament. And the point here is, if you 
May God, the proper object of trust, you'll avoid hypocrisy. Yeah, 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 that's what's coming up. That's what's coming up. So remember, this is dealing with hypocrisy. We're to be totally honest and open. We trust God rather than man. That uh, relieves our, our tendency to be hypocrites. We trust God. That'll relieve our tendency to be hypocrites. And then verses 8 and 9. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man, shall confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men shall be denied before the angel of God. And uh, point D there is the importance of confessing your faith in Jesus, in Christ. To be a secret believer is to be dabbling in hypocrisy, trying to hide your light. So don't be a hypocrite. Uh, be open about your faith in me. You don't have to wear your Christianity on, its, on your sleeve, but uh, we can't hide what our faith is either. All right, verse 10. And everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. And here he warns them against the danger of committing the unpardonable sin. Remember, don't speak a word against me. Now, we're going to keep this in context. You learned what the unpardonable sin was back in Matthew chapter 12, right? Everybody remember that? So, guess what? Pop quiz. Pop quiz. Define the unpardonable sin. This is very important. Anyone like to take a shot at the formal definition that we learned back in Matthew 12? You want to shoot at it? Okay. Okay, on what basis? On what basis? Does yeah. Anyone want to add a little bit more to that? Possession. All right, the demon possession, right? Okay, you guys got it. Everybody gets an A, right? All right, here it is. The unpardonable sin. Develop, that this definition is developed from the context. A lot of people use a lot of speculation when they... When they uh, de describe the unpardonable sin. A lot of people are afraid. They come to you, you know, have I ever committed the unpardonable sin? Have I lost my salvation? This is a, a rampant problem that I've uh, run into. Can you keep that up? Yeah, yeah. You've got it back on Lesson 12. You have it best on, back on Lesson 12, but it's okay if you want to write it down here. This is very important. I want you to burn this into your brain. What is the unpardonable sin? It is the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus by the nation of Israel while he was present on the grounds of being demon-possessed. Where did the Holy Spirit come in here? That he was saying the last thing in the Holy Spirit in Matthew, right? Right. But you don't have that there, so to speak. Well, he is being empowered by the Spirit. He's been baptized by the Spirit. And so this is a spirit-led ministry, so that is a, in, so uh, rejecting him when he was present is in, to insult the Spirit of God. Okay, remember, it's the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus by the nation Israel while he was present on the grounds of being demon-possessed. It's, it's over and done with. We'll take a look at the judgment the unpardonable judgment that came out of this has happened. It's over with. We'll look at that in just a second. So uh, everybody writing this down? Okay. Do I have a question? Yes. As you will see, no. As we go through this, the masses, as we have seen at the beginning of this lesson, are slowly begin, beginning to go over to the Pharisees' position. Okay? And this is the state of the nation today. 
99% of us still reject the Messiahship of Jesus. That's not, that is not the unpardonable sin, because it, the unpardonable sin can only be committed by that generation there. But no, the vast majority of Jewish people have uh, always rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. Well, now the mentality is different because we're in Judea rather than... Yes, we're in Judea now, yes. So this is kind of like a parallel to even today's world. Yeah, right. All right, what was the judgment of the unpardonable sin? The dis yes, the judgment of the unpardonable sin was the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Why was this an unpardonable sin? It was unpardonable because the moment the Jewish community rejected the Messiahship of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, the temple and the city of Jerusalem were doomed. Nothing could alleviate that judgment. We will see when we get to the triumphal entry that Jesus is acclaimed the Messiah by the masses. Why doesn't he just say, oh, everything's forgiven, everything's grand, I'm the Messiah, and go on. What is his words? His words are words of judgment. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew the time of your visitation, but your house is left to you desolate. And that's why he wept over Jerusalem. So the moment he was rejected back in Matthew chapter 12, Jerusalem and the temple were doomed. This judgment could not be alleviated by anything. Now individuals can move out from underneath this judgment by placing their faith in Yeshua, and they do that. But those who do not are subject to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Okay, does that make sense? All this comes out of your context. Okay? This isn't developed by speculation. This is the context of the terminology. Yes. That's yes. The the state of the nation. Right. The state of the nation will be worse than at the first. Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. Okay. Instead of just being dominated by Rome, we will be de uh, de decimated by Rome. Okay? That make sense? All right, so he warns the disciples. Our generation, no, you can't commit the unpardonable sin today. It's over, it's done with, it's, uh, it's nothing to worry about for us today. Okay, the, as soon as the temple was destroyed in AD 70, the judgment was completed. Yes, nothing we need to be concerned about today. All right, keep it in context, okay? All right, so he's warned them, don't get involved with the uh, unpardonable sin, don't get involved with, don't turn your mind, change your mind, and uh, reject me, to move away from me. All right, verses 11 and 12, the final lesson for the disciples. And verses 11 and 12 are on page 142. Top of page 142, verse 11. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. So when uh, they are persecuted for their proclamation of the Messiahship of Jesus. They'll be brought into the synagogues. Don't be concerned about how you'll defend yourself. God will give you wisdom at that moment. So basically, pay attention to these six lessons and you will avoid hypocrisy in your life, disciples. Trust God. Uh, you know, trust Him to give you the words that you're going to say. Uh, don't turn your back on me, etc., if you do all these things, you will avoid the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Okay, the leaven of the Pharisees. All right, let's move on to section 147. Warning about greed and trust in wealth. We're at the top of page 21. Section 147 is at the top of page 142. We'll pick it up on verses 13 through 15. And someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he said to him, but he said to him, Man, who appointed me as judge and arbiter over you? 
And he said to them, Beware, be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even one who has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Greed. That's the spirit of this world, isn't it? That's the spirit of this age. And it doesn't matter what social uh, level you're at. You can be in a third world country and you can be very poor. You can be in the United States and be on welfare. You can be in a rich country like the United States and you can be a rich person. Greed will be found in your heart. What was it, uh, the famous statement? Was it John D. Rockefeller or something? What does it take to make you happy? Just one dollar more. Okay, that's greed. That's greed. It was present in the first century. It's present today. We've got to watch out for it. Now, I'm an equal opportunity offender. So I'm going to put a little joke up here for you guys. Now, this is only meant for fun, all right? But I felt it reflected the spirit of this age, okay? Comparison of religious ideas. Capitalism. Capitalism, that's a religion, isn't it? That's our religion in this country. He who dies with the most toys wins, right? You've seen that as a bumper sticker. That's the religion of capitalism. Anglican, but they were our toys first. <laughs> Greek Orthodox. No, they were ours first. And I have to identify with this because I once gave a talk, I think it was at a Rotary Club in the area, on religious freedom. It was a religious freedom day or something. And it was me, a Jewish Christian, a Catholic guy, and a Greek Orthodox guy. So I gave up and I did my little five-minute spiel. And the Catholic guy gave up, got up and he did his five-minute spiel. And then the Greek Orthodox guy got up and he did exactly this. All he said was, we were first. We're the true religion, you know, you need to follow us. We were first. So I really had to laugh at that when I saw that. All right, capitalism, Anglicanism, Greek Orthodox, evolutionism. That's a religion in this age, isn't it? The toys made themselves. How about New Age? Go stand in front of your mirror and contemplate your inner toy. <laughs> And finally, the Jewish community. We want to be equal opportunity offenders here. He who buys toys at the lowest price wins. All right. Now that I've offended everybody in the room. Well, <laughs> you, well all you guys have to do is go to getamuse.com. Get all right. See it there? www.getamuse.com. All right. You'll probably find it there. No, they didn't. So they weren't amused, yeah. <laughs> you guys want this, huh? All right, okay. All right. What? No, I don't get them all from there. All right. All right, you guys will get this slide. Okay. Now my point, my point, we're dealing here with greed, G-R-E-E-E-E-E-E-D, okay? Tell my brother to, to divide the inheritance with me. Now, when that guy yells out to Jesus and demands that he intervene in his personal family life, Jesus quotes at him Exodus 2, 13 and 14, okay? He went out the next day, and this is Moses. This is the book of Exodus. Moses went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Remember the day before, Moses had killed that Egyptian overseer. Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. All right, what's going on here? Why in the world would Yeshua choose to refer to that verse at this time? Well, the reason lies in the fact that these were the words used against Moses in chapter 2 of Exodus. When Moses offered himself the first time as Israel's deliverer, 
The people rejected the, the authority of Moses, who made you a judge over us. This led to Moses' flight from Egypt to Midian, and he stayed in Midian 40 years. Only when Moses returned a second time was his authority accepted. This beginning to make sense? Okay. In the same way, Yeshua offered himself the first time as king and has been rejected. Because his messianic authority has been rejected, he is not going to judge anybody. He's not going to step in and exercise his authority as the king. That's why he says, who made me a judge and arbiter over you? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I've not been accepted as Messiah King. So he quotes the words by which Moses was rejected. Now, what this is, Jesus has just done a drosh. Now, what in the world is a drosh, Bob? Well, a drosh is a literal prophecy plus an application. Now, I'm going to go over this chart with you. And this chart is back in Lesson 2, page 26. You have this chart already. In our introductory material, we covered it. But this is a good time to review it, get it a little more fresh in your mind. So we're just going to go through it quickly. When we went through Matthew chapter 2, we went through this in detail. Uh, back in Lesson 2, page 26. So if you want to turn back there, that's fine. Lesson 2, page 26. You'll find this chart. Okay, everybody who found it, wants it, found it. So let's just go through the chart real quick. And uh, you can ask me questions later after the class about it. But uh, the chart is the New Covenant usages of passages in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. We'll look at the rabbinic term, the usage, the verse, and the example. So the first rabbinic term is Peshat. A Peshat talks about the plain sense or literal interpretation. We would call that, if we were dealing with a prophecy, we would call that literal prophecy plus literal fulfillment. Micah 5, 2 is an example, and Matthew does a drosh in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. The second usage of the uh, Old Testament passages is a remez. That's the allegorical or philosophical usage. We would call it a literal prophecy plus a typical fulfillment, a type. An example of that is Hosea 11.1, 1, and Matthew did a remez in Matthew 2.15. So these are all valid ways to handle the Old Testament scripture. The third way is the drosh, the agotic, don't worry about that word, or homiletical approach. We would call it a literal prophecy plus application. Another example is Jeremiah 31, 15. Matthew did a drosh in Matthew 2, 17 and 18. And the final and fourth way is called the sowed by the rabbis. That's their mystical interpretation. We would call it summation. Usually there is no single verse quoted because the statement is a summary of what the Tanakh taught about the Messiah. And uh, Matthew did a summation in Matthew 2.23 2, 2, uh, when dealing with uh, the, the prophet said he'll be called a Nazarene. So what we have before us here is Jesus doing a drosh. He is doing an application. He's taking this situation out of Moses' life and he's saying, it's a similar situation that is occurring right now. I'm applying it to what's happening to me. This is an application. Okay, does that make sense? Why he chooses to say what he says here. Now, by the way, this whole idea is found in rabbinic writings. And the idea here is that the Messiah follows the pattern of Moses. This is called the obscuration of the Messiah. If you'd like in to, look, to look in this in detail, I've recommended the Messiah texts to you in the past by Raphael Patai. And Raphael Patai is just an Israeli scholar. I don't believe he's still alive. He may be. But if you'd like to pick up that book, you'll find it very invaluable, the Messiah text by Raphael Patai. Now, this is what you read on page 31. Uh, Dr. Patai writes, nor does the redemption follow immediately upon the appearance of the Redeemer. After he is revealed, he is hidden. And only upon his second appearance does the great global process of redemption begin. 
That sound familiar? Yeah. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh-huh, yeah, New Testament. Thus, Rabbi Barachiah is reported to have said, as the first redeemer, Moses, so the last redeemer, Messiah. Just as the first redeemer was revealed to the children of Israel and then again hidden from them, so the last redeemer, Messiah, will be revealed and then again hidden from them. Okay, don't let anyone ever tell you that Jewish people are not expecting one Messiah to come twice. This is the line you'll hear these days. Oh, we only believe in one Messiah who comes one time. You guys, you know, this Jesus thing is off the wall. That's not true. The point is that the Messiah follows the pattern of Moses. Two appearances. He comes, he is rejected, he is hidden, he returns, he is accepted, and the redemption occurs. That's the pattern. All right? Don't let anyone intimidate you with anything else. Question? Bob, well, we have a handout of that excerpt right there. <laughs> that's, that's good. That okay. Is, that's All right. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of handouts next week. No, I'm happy to do it. You, you guys are my babies. I need to do anything you need. All right. Huh? Just, just put an offering in the pushka box. All right. All right, let's move on. Let's move on then. We're now at instruction at the bottom of the page. Uh, since he's addressing the masses, he's addressing these thousands that are stepping all over each other. Notice what he says in verse 16. Notice what he says there. And I think we'll be able to get through this, only keep you over a couple of minutes. Verses 16 through 21. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All right. So he's teaching the, the, the masses, right? So he issues a parable. The point of the parable, the folly and the sin and the danger of carrying things beyond your present need. In other words, greed. You see, this man's sin in the parable is not that he did planning and not that he was a successful farmer. That's no problem. The problem is he left God out of his planning. He left God out of his life. Okay? And that's where he was a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So he was a practical atheist. Okay? That's his problem. So the application comes at the top of page 22. Next page. <clears throat> the application is in verses 22 through 34. Top of page 22 in your outline. Verse 22. And he said to his disciples, notice the shift in uh, training now. He said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. For life is more than food and the body than clothing. Unless, of course, you're buying a hot of our polo shirt. <laughs> All right. All right, bad joke. For life is more than food, and the body than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And by which, by being anxious, and which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you, are you anxious about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. 
But I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow was thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O man of little faith? And do not seek what you shall eat and what you shall drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things shall be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves purses which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So notice how he shifts his attention now. He gives the parable to the masses, but to the disciples he explains it clearly. And he makes two major points here. Number one, if we seek God's kingdom as the primary factor in our lives, then the necessities of life will be given to us. So don't be greedy for more. Trust God. Trust your Heavenly Father. And secondly, where should we be placing our, our, um, our uh, store, our treasure? We should be storing up our treasure in heaven. We need to keep our eyes on the promises of God because He's promised us a better kingdom and a better country. And up on the screen here is an illustration of the Messianic kingdom. You know, that's what he's promised us, you guys. We have trouble in this life, but he's promised us, for example, th Psalm 37, 11, the humble will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Okay, we don't need to be greedy for the things of this world. We don't have to strive for the... Uh, the, it, with an attitude that the world has of greed. More, 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 just one dollar more. One new car. A little bit bigger house. Another pair of shoes. Okay? We need to be content what he provides. Now, he said all these things in the Sermon on the Mount. And remember, he's repeating instruction given in Galilee for the Judeans. So during this preaching tour, he is exposing the Judeans now personally to his person and his teaching. All right, that brings us to the end of our uh, lessons for, um, this, uh, for tonight. We'll pick it up next week on page um, 22 of your outline, section 148, with the warning against being unprepared for the Son of Man's coming. All right, let me pray, and then we'll uh, turn you loose to head on home. Father, again, we want to thank you for your word. And again, thank you for the challenges that it puts before us. The challenge not to be hypocrites, but to trust you because of your great love for us. Uh, even though you know every bit of us, we can be open and honest before you and before men. And um, be open and honest about our trust and faith in you. Not to hide it. And to live the way you would want us to live. And then, Lord, the challenge to put away greed. Whenever we see that uh, ugly little sin raise its, um, raise its head in our lives, we need to remember that we need to be content with what you've provided, and not to be striving constantly for what the nations of the world strive for. Help us, Lord. We're so caught up in this because of this is the spirit of the age. And we need your spirit in our hearts, doing a work in our hearts, changing our hearts, so that um, we can stand out from this age and be your witnesses. And we ask you to help us to do that step by step, day by day. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All righty, we'll see you guys next week.